In March 1493, Clifford and Stanley had a conversation in which Stanley said that if Perkin Warbeck really was Edward IV's son, then he would have to, uh, he would be unable to take arms against him because of oaths that he had previously made to Edward IV and which he felt still bound him. Henry, I think, probably confronted him with this information, and Stanley was in a catch-22 position. Um, Stanley was executed, and Fitzwalter, who was also implicated in these uh, treasonable uh, conversations, was at first imprisoned and then a couple of years later executed himself. Henry's reaction to these plots within his own household proved that although he was inexperienced as uh, a king. He had had little of the formal training which uh, English kings might expect in the household of great noblemen or in the household of the king himself. Henry was nevertheless a very wily politician. His education, of course, had been uh, gained while in exile in Brittany and then in France and in what Paul Strome has called a pre-Machiavellian political culture which flourished in 15th century France. Strom has characterised this pre-Machiavellian political culture as one of plots, of dissembling, of spies, and, if you like, a move from the chivalric culture of the Middle Ages to a more Renaissance, more, more Machiavellian culture. We know that Henry was using tricks uh, he was using plots and spies himself to escape uh, the clutches of the Yorkist kings in the 1470s and 1480s. He, of course, famously disguised himself to escape the clutches of Richard III and escaping from Brittany to France in 1484. Henry proved himself uh, a master of these pre-Machiavellian politics throughout his reign. Henry was very suspicious by nature. We know that in the last years of his reign, he was investigating men who were, if you like, uh, who should have been his closest and most loyal supporters. Giles Daubney, for example, the Chamberlain of his household, and a man who had joined him in exile in 1483, was investigated in 1507 and 1508. Daubney's will, made in 1509, makes it very clear that he was uh, very angry about this and that he couldn't understand why his professions of loyalty had not been respected by the king. Other members of Henry's household who had previously served the Yorkist kings were also the, uh, the centre of investigation by Henry. Perhaps the most famous of these is Sir Richard Guildford. Guildford if I think was probably threatened with uh, the same fate as Stanley. And in 1506, Guildford went on a pilgrimage to Jerusalem from which he never returned. The best example of Henry's application of this real politique is his activities in the 1500s and his relationship with Edmund de la Pole, Earl of Suffolk. Suffolk was the brother of the Earl of Lincoln, Richard III's nephew, and heir apparent. Suffolk was always mindful, I think, of the suspicion uh, that surrounded his family uh, and the way he was treated by Henry VII, at least in his own mind, confirmed this. He was prevented by Henry from um, pursuing a case at law. He was accused of manslaughter and forced to pay a huge fine, and was demoted from uh, a dukedom uh, to an earldom. In 1501, Suffolk, who clearly had had enough of all this, fled to the Low Countries. It's unclear whether he wanted to actually set himself up as a, uh, a proper uh, Yorkist claimant, between 1501 and 1506, Henry paid tens of thousands of pounds to Philip the Fair, Duke of Burgundy, to keep de la Pole under watch. And in 1506, de la Pole was delivered to Henry by the Burgundians and put in prison, on the proviso that he was kept alive. Henry, of course, kept to his word. His son, Henry VIII, didn't. And on the eve of his um, French campaign of 1513, de la Pole was executed.
As well as this policy of repression and uh, surveillance, Henry also uh, had a policy of compromise. The best example of this, of course, is his marriage to Elizabeth of York. This was something which he had promised to do in 1483, um, which made those former members of the Yorkist household feel perhaps able to support him over Richard III. When King, Henry was forced, I suppose, to continu continue this policy of conciliation. And many former members of Edward's household were uh, given offices and uh, received into the king's grace. A good example of this is John Lord Dinham, who had been one of Edward's closest supporters and his lieutenant of Calais. Although Dinham was replaced as lieutenant of Calais by Giles Daubney, he was in 1485 appointed to the post of Treasurer of England, perhaps the second most important position in Henry's government. This conciliation of former Yorkist uh, members of the household uh, continued throughout the reign. Another good example of this is Henry's uh, policy towards the city of York, the second or third largest uh, city in the realm. York was well known for its support of Richard III, and in 1485 uh, found itself in a very difficult position. Henry offered to... Uh, help them out financially by remitting part of their fee farm, the annual payment that they made to the crown, in return uh, for their loyalty. And Henry uh, intervened in local elections in York to ensure that men loyal to himself were actually appointed to positions of responsibility within the city. So in conclusion, I think we can say that the Yorkists were not a real threat to Henry VII. Certainly in the mid-1490s, Perkin Warbeck made life difficult for Henry and had more of Henry's uh, servants, if more noblemen, if more landowners generally, had been willing to support Warbeck, then Henry's position might well have been compromised. Warbeck, though, was principally a threat because of the role that he played uh, in European politics. At this time, there was jockeying position for position between the rival kingdoms of France and England and the Duchy of Burgundy, and Warbeck was a useful tool for all three of these princes to play each other off against the other. There is evidence that the Yorkist uh, threat continued throughout the reign, but I think this has really been overestimated by historians. One of the key pieces of evidence that historians use to point to the persistence of Yorkist threats in the last years of Henry's reign is the so-called Flamanc Conversation. This is a mysterious document, but it purports to be a report of a conversation had between the chief officers of Calais, the last uh, outpost, uh, English outpost on the continent, discussing the future of the Tudor succession. The conversation was dated, has been dated to 1503, so it's immediately after the death of both Elizabeth of York and Henry's heir, Prince Arthur. They discuss the merits of Henry VII, and while other people, while they say that other people have discussed the Duke of Buckingham as a possible successor to Henry, few people, it seemed, had discussed the possibility of Henry, Duke of York, later to be Henry VIII, actually succeeding his father as King of England. This document, I think, which is really the only evidence that we have of uh, really deep-seated doubts about Henry's kingship, has certainly been overestimated by historians. Recent research has shown that Flamanc, John Flamanc himself, the author of this conversation, had a personal uh, argument with the chief officers of Calais, particularly Richard Nanfan, the deputy there. And in reporting this conversation to, Flama uh, to Henry VII, Flamanc may have hoped to uh, have got back his job in Calais and seen those people who had removed him themselves removed from office. It's interesting that when Flamanc himself did go back to Calais in 1509, him and his brother were actually beaten up in the town square by soldiers who were angry that he had uh, betrayed the trust 
of Richard Nanfan and the other officers of the garrison. In the final analysis then, the Yorkist threats were not serious. They've been overestimated by historians, I think, and even the term Yorkist itself is really an invention of modern-day historians. The so-called Yorkist threat was in fact a collection of disparate individuals, some desperate, others doubtless uh, motivated by their loyalty to the Yorkist kings Edward IV, Edward V and Richard III. It's a measure though of Henry's success and his skill in dealing with these plots that he was the first king really since 1422 to pass on the throne undisputed to his son and of course he established a dynasty, the Tudors, who would reign for over a hundred years. <laughs>